Welcome back. I'm Jeff Yee, and this is video number three of the Particles of the Universe series. And this one is on particles, right? subatomic particles to be exact. Last time, I showed an example of magnetic balls that I used as an illustration of an atomic nucleus. Right? Protons and neutrons in an atom. And the interesting thing about this is that all of matter, everything, has been simplified to be atoms, and atoms that consist of a unique number of protons. One proton, right, just one tiny little proton, is hydrogen. You add another proton to it along with two additional neutrons to separate them, and it's now helium. And there's 118 different elements in the periodic table of elements, all based on a unique number of protons. And so that's pretty cool, right? Nature was simplified that everything around us is simply just a combination of protons. But here's the crazy thing about it. You take two of those protons now, and when you smash them together, there's dozens of these little tiny particles, subatomic particles, that appear. And the question is this. Why would nature tease us with its simplicity that everything in matter is simply just a combination of protons in an atom. Yeah, of course there's electrons too, but it's simply a combination of protons. And then as we go deeper and deeper, it becomes complex again. Why is that? And why would nature do that to us? Or do we just not understand it? Two quick reminders before starting the video. The first is that all the information in this presentation is available in both the books and on the website in the URLs you see. And the second is I will cover blue slides in detail and red slides you can pause at any time to read, such as this one, which covers the wave constants and variables that will be used in the presentation. All right, so now let's get into particles and explaining particle energy and mass. Now, if energy flows as waves, which we talked about in the last video, and if a fundamental particle referred to as a wave center moves to minimize wave amplitude, again, covered in the last video as the principal cause of all motion and forces, then subatomic particles can be modeled as a collection of wave centers. Now that's pretty cool, so let's get into this. First, the neutrino. The neutrino is a known particle. And in this theory, it's actually the likely candidate uh, for the component known as the wave center. And if that's true, it would make the neutrino the fundamental particle that creates all other particles. That's radically different than the current understanding of the neutrino, so we need to get into a lot of detail and proof on this one. So first is that the energy of a single wave center is calculated to be near the upper range of the neutrino, and that's why it's the likely candidate. Um, but first, how did I calculate that energy value of 2.39 electron volts? Well, you remember from the last section that particles are standing waves of energy, and in the case of the neutrino, it has one wave center. And all standing waves can be calculated based on a number of wave centers, and the fundamental particle has just one. This is a red slide. Um, so you, pausing here, but you can read through it uh, later, but this is the details of how to get from those wave constants to that value of 2.39 electron volts. Now, but let's get into the details about wave centers and how they position to create other particles. Now, wave center may locate in groups, but if you recall from the last section, they move to minimize their wave amplitude. And in a standing wave, there's what's called a node, which is the point of minimal amplitude. Now, this model is very similar to atomic elements. Right? Protons and neutrons combine together in an atomic nucleus to form the different elements. And this model would actually explain why we see the creation of particles or what's called neutrino oscillation where a neutrino that's been sent from the sun to earth can grow in mass. It's 
called neutrino oscillation is quite strange and it's never really been explained about how that happens, but it would make a lot of sense if two or more neutrinos combine to create a new one. What is more commonly seen is decay. Particles decay all the time. You know, they last for a fraction of a second when created in particle accelerators. And a combination model, a combination of multiple particles, a combination of wave centers, makes a lot of sense. If particles can combine and then decay based on wave centers that are not evenly spaced at nodes in a standing wave. So here is now a combination of wave centers and how it affects the particle energy. Now, two things happen when a wave center combines with another wave, wave center. Its amplitude increases, and it increases spherically, you know, three-dimensional. This is a uh, wavelets that form a wave front in a sphere, but it also extends the particle radius to the point where standing waves transition to traveling waves. And that's why it hasn't been so easy to spot a fundamental particle for all other particles like it was for protons to form an atomic nucleus. And that's because the energy of these particles uh, exponentially increase. Now there's a new letter that's been assigned to this similar to the number of protons that make up an atomic nucleus and that's represented by the letter Z. The letter K represents a number of wave centers and that's used throughout uh, these equations. This is a visual now of what a standing wave would look like. In the middle you see a wave center and a particle that has standing waves until the point where it has to transition. Those are little tiny bumps that you see beyond that which are traveling waves. And so that point at which it does the transition becomes the particle's radius and everything that's in the middle there as standing waves becomes the particle's rest energy or is also considered to be mass and mass is simply just energy without the consideration of wave speed. Now to be able to calculate the rest energy of particles a new equation had to be built and it's based on those four fundamental wave properties that were discussed in the previous video, which are wave speed, wavelength, wave amplitude, in a known density. And the volume in this case now is a sphere, and it's a sphere that can grow based on the particle radius, which is a function of the number of wave centers. And so the letter K exists in this equation as well because it represents the number of wave centers. But that's really it. This is the equation now that can model particle energy. This gets into a lot of detail. This is a red slide. But again, pause for five seconds. You can pause your video at any time to go through the derivation of how the equation is created. Now a fundamental particle model makes a lot of sense to explain why neutrinos might oscillate. right? Because there's a handful of wave centers that need to combine at energy levels that happen in nature, such as traveling from the sun to earth. But for something that requires a lot more fundamental wave centers to be put together and assembled, requires high energy experiments, such as particle accelerators here on earth. But another thing that came about when putting together the longitudinal energy equation is that leptons. And leptons are the neutrino family, there's three neutrinos, and the electron family, there's three electrons, that they appear at uh, wave center numbers, or K, at values of uh, 2, 8, 20, 28, 50. And that's with the exception of the electron itself. These numbers, 2, 8, 20, 28, and 50, are the same numbers that are seen as magic numbers, as they're called in atomic elements. And that means that the most stable elements tend to be the ones at these numbers or for a combination of protons and neutrons in an atomic nucleus. What makes that interesting is that the leptons are the particles that are most often found in nature and they happen to be at the same numbers. 
which ha has to be more than a, a coincidence. Now the electron is the most stable out of all those particles, and it has a wave center value k of 10. Now this value of 10 could possibly be in a geometric formation known as a tetrahedron. And a tetrahedron is probably the most simple geometric uh, formation in three-dimensional space. And if, a waves, if waves are coming from all direction, right, there are spherical wavelets forming a wave front, you'll see here in the picture that most of the wave centers would be at standing wave nodes. And again, that's the requirement for a wave center to be stable. Therefore, it keeps the particle stable. Yet there is one wave direction here where the wave center highlighted in red is not on the node. It will be forced to move. In the case of the electron, it doesn't decay because most of the wave centers are on a node. Come back to this in a moment. But first, and again, this is a red slide, but one that's animated, so I will leave this up for more than five seconds. What is interesting here is in 2008, the top video that you see there in black and blue is an electron that was filmed at Lund University in Sweden. And it does two things. One, it shows a standing wave property. You can see the computer model there at the bottom. They're nearly similar. Right? It looks like a standing wave of energy. Now, the second thing here is that the number of wavelengths in this model should be uh, proportional to the number of wave centers, 10. And we see that here, there's roughly about 10 wavelengths in the filming of a real electron. This is the value k, it's a red slide, so I will move on. This is also a red slide, but here you'll see the uh, mass and energy of the electron was calculated at, uh, and to be the exact known codata values. There's uh, another constant that's used throughout these wave equations that requires a little bit of explanation. Uh, this is a derived constant, um, but the electron is the most important particle uh, out of every particle within this theory. And it's, it consists of shells of energy tend to be specific in the case of the electron because there's 10 wave centers and therefore 10 electron wavelengths. And so each one of those is a spherical shell of energy. It's standing wave energy, um, but it decreases rapidly as it goes from the core to the perimeter before it breaks down to be standing waves. And so this is a, a constant referred to as the outer shells and given the letter O. And here is the value. This is the calculation of the electron's classical radius based on the number of wavelengths, which is based um, itself on the uh, property of the longitudinal uh, wavelength and the number of wave centers that you see there. And it correctly calculates the electron's classical radius. All right, here's another thing that's cool. Now. Atomic elements, which we referred to earlier, there was um, one coincidence, which was lepton particles occur at magic numbers. Uh, there's another uh, coincidence, which is the largest currently known particle, the Higgs boson, uh, is calculated with a wave center count of 117. What makes that interesting is that the periodic table of elements has 118 um, you know, uh, protons in the atomic nucleus. But I think the most amazing thing, uh, which is a lot more than a coincidence, is when you map atomic mass to atomic number, that's the proton count, you end up with a linear function. You can see that in graph number one, atomic elements. Now, when the longitudinal energy equation was used, um, because the k value is to the power of uh, five, the fifth power, if you divide by the fourth power of k, you end up with a linear function. And the bottom right graph there, uh, when, when it's done this way, is a graph identical to the atomic elements, where the particle number is on the bottom, starting with 1 from the neutrino to 117 for the Higgs. 
And a linear function now maps all of those particles. Very, very similar to what was done with atomic elements nearly a century ago. This is uh, more detail, so you can see the graph on a little bit larger view. Um, and again, the steps that's required to reproduce uh, this graph. It's also available to be downloaded from the website. Now earlier, the electron was described as having a wave center that was off node. The electron has a really curious spin. Right? It's called half spin, which basically means it uh, takes two rotations before it returns back to normal. Now the electron is not a true sphere, which is why this happens. It's a tetrahedron. And there will always be a wave center that is off node. As one is, uh, corrects itself to be on the node, it forces another to be off. And so it's doing this strange rotation, but that is the cause of the electron spin. Most of the wave centers are on the node, and so it has um, the ability to stay uh, as a particle and not decay like most of them do. But because it's not truly, not all of the wave centers are truly on the node, it will introduce a spin of a particle. And that spin is going to be the cause of uh, some forces coming up in the section on forces. And I think at this point, it's important to know and understand that the electron responds to spherical longitudinal waves. And it reflects those waves, becoming standing waves. And that's the rest energy of the particle. But that one wave center that's off node, that's now moving, is creating a secondary transverse wave that looks something like this. But energy is always conserved. And we're going to be coming back to this and discussing this one in the next video. So you'll want to remember this slide. The first, a, a summary of particles. Because of the similarities between uh, particles and elements, uh, here the same table, the periodic sequence, has been used to map the known particles into a very similar table called the periodic table of particles. That concludes the video on particles. Now that we know particles move to minimize wave amplitude and it's the cause of all forces, we will explore those forces in more detail in video number four.